Hello everyone. In this episode, we're going to continue our study of comparative economic development with a special focus now in this episode on the question of convergence, which basically means at this time, are the developing countries, that is to say the low income and middle income countries, growing faster than the developed rich countries so that over time we would have some catch up. If, you're, if the developing world is growing faster, low and middle income countries growing faster than the rich developed countries, then at least after some lag, they would tend to reach that level. It's called convergence. There's more than one kind of convergence. There can be health and education convergence and that's been looked at as well, but this is just focusing on income. And accordingly, to give a picture of this, there's some data based on seven countries. And the period will run from 1750 to 2010. There's always some lag in getting from uh, the, uh, the very best um, international data. It takes time to process because you have to do serious, real purchasing power parity terms, but this gets the idea across, I think, very well. And so that we have seven representative um, countries, I think it's often um, easier to look at the country level. And so these are believed to be good data, although, you know, they have to be reconstructed back into the past. And the further you go into the past, the more difficult it is for economic historians to reproduce what was gross domestic product in various periods of time. But these are considered, widely considered, very good estimates. And so it begins around 1750, which is roughly the period where industrialization um, began. It's dated to different um, periods, but 1750 is one um, benchmark that we can um, use. If we go back to 1750, we see that already at this time, two economies, that of the United States and the United Kingdom, were somewhat ahead, were certainly ahead, um, um, perhaps a uh, ratio of three to one, two and a half to one, two to one. Um, some of the other countries represented here, Japan, India, Brazil, China, and Nigeria. And so this is not in log scale, so as you can, you can get a sense that this is representing exponential growth. And in fact, that is what we're seeing with respect to the leading countries in the case of the United States, which has um, had the highest income um, or output per person correlated closely, but not the same as income per person. This is output per person um, having uh, surpassed the United Kingdom somewhere around or just before the turn of the previous century, 19th to 20th century. So that's uh, a benchmark. And this output per person has been growing over a very long period of time at about 2% per year in output per worker, which is a historically you know, unprecedented growth. And it reflects fundamentally the Industrial Revolution. It's been called the lever of riches, the Industrial Revolution, that is to say, using levers, in other words, using technology, primarily to augment productivity and have higher levels of income as well. And so, um, as you may be able to see here, for a long term period of time, well into the uh, 20th um, uh, century, um, certainly, well into the 20th century, there was very little output per person growth in some of the represented developing uh, countries here. And then there has been growth more recently. And so for a long time, the idea was you have relative stagnation in developing countries and continued growth in the industrialized countries. And this is the period, and this is the understanding behind calling the rich OECD high income countries, the industrialized um, countries. Even though later in greater or lesser terms and um, at different periods of time, low and middle income countries became industrialized to varying degrees as well. So this is sometimes called the great divergence as compared to convergence for at least two centuries and most likely longer, but about two centuries, um, there's no doubt that there was a growing 
steadily growing gap between the highest productivity, highest income countries, and the and and the rest, but the low and um, middle income countries as they were at that time. And so part of the question, of course, is why um, we you know, can point in terms of productivity to industrialization, which raised output per worker, as I say. But then the question is, what were the conditions that led to that? Why these um, developed countries in particular, uh, these European countries, and what some call the neo-Europe's, the offshoots, it's said, of European countries, civilizations, usually described primarily as the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, industrialized first and indeed um, became the only countries to really industrialize until um, much later. Japan was the first to, to follow in that. And so here we have the US, here we have the UK, here we have the dramatic takeoff of Japan for the second half of the 20th century and so this was the case that proved it was possible that a country that had not been industrialized and was not a Western country or Western offshoot country um, could indeed make this, um, this transition. And later on, we see cases such as that of China, um, which in these data, you know, you can roughly see has reached, had reached around the stage of the U.S in, let's say, you know, the middle of the century, certainly. And so other countries are beginning to show growth here as well, including India, Brazil, and Nigeria, starting from different periods of time and at different growth rates. And so the question is whether this growth that we're beginning to see in, some, in the well, many countries in the developing world is um, fast enough, you know, moving above something close to zero, but it's fast enough to catch up. And the general sentiment until very, very uh, recently was that convergence had not occurred, was not occurring. And the, and the great debate and the great mystery was why not? Why is convergence not occurring? Which you'll see in most books on the subject. It's, uh, it's something that has changed uh, relatively recently. And economists think there are two main reasons to think that convergence would be a natural thing to do and to see. One has to do with the diminishing marginal productivity of capital. That a major reason, certainly not the only reason, but one major reason why the high income countries have been productive is that they have invested a great deal of capital. If workers have a lot of capital to work with, they can be more productive, which is higher output per person. That's our measure of productivity. Um, and so that if there's a lot of capital in some areas and less capital in other areas with diminishing marginal returns to investment and input and capital in this case, you expect that there's a very high incentive to move some of the capital from the high income, capital abundant parts of the world to the lower income, capital scarce parts of the world. And indeed we have seen some of that. The second major reason is that underlying productivity are fundamentally productive ideas. So even more important than capital is going to be the knowledge base about productivity. Capital you can create. If you see capital somewhere else, you can try to emulate it and invest more. Ideas are harder to generate. And in fact, in many cases, there's barriers for ideas to go across, uh, go across countries. But nonetheless, despite that, um, <clears throat> people everywhere are smart. And so the, you know, the human history is um, full of examples of different parts of the world borrowing the best of ideas from, from everywhere else, from trade routes or other things. And so the spread of ideas, because people absorb ideas from the best ideas from wherever they can get them usually, is the other of the two main reasons why economists were in some sense stumped um, about why there was so little um, catch-up um, going on. And there were different theories about this. <clears throat> when we get to chapter three, we will see that 
One of those uh, theories is the dependency school that believed that the developing countries' um, problems stemmed fundamentally from unequal international relations. And so we'll take a, a look at that. So then the question is, what has happened with some countries now growing faster? Um, and so I think actually that I covered this for the most part. The only thing I would like to add is that so far we have been talking about um, absolute con uh, convergence. Just looking at whether incomes of countries that are starting with lower output per worker are catching up just by themselves. There's another very important concept which is called conditional convergence. And that says that the theory of convergence doesn't just apply in general, but the amount of convergence is conditional on, depends upon um, certain conditions present. And those conditions can certainly include the amount of investment, uh, you know, very understandably, but some other factors um, as well. So that we'll come back and talk about this. This is primarily talked about in the um, context, or often talked about in the context of the neoclassical growth model, and we will come back to that as well. For the moment, we're looking at this absolute convergence concept. And so here we had a picture of the 20th century. And in this picture of the 20th century, in log terms, now, first of all, we see that very steady 2% per year productivity growth that was found in developed countries, including the US, but also the United Kingdom. Um, and it seemed that you'd go back to that 2% no matter what you did to the economy. So you could um, sort of uh, zap it with the uh, Great Depression, as we see here. The country slowly comes out of the Great Depression. There's a little recession, not so little, um, around 38. And then, of course, and then it's back on track. And then, of course, World War II begins about 19, depending on where you are in the U.S. at the end of 1941. And here we have this unprecedented buildup in output per person. This is because the entire economy became oriented as much as possible on an emergency basis to produce um, equipment such as tanks to fight in Europe against the Nazis and in the Pacific against Japanese militarism. And so this too, though, was out of whack, right? And so you can see that with demobilization after World War II, you don't need to make tanks anymore, and so on. There was a fall. There were many at the time, historically, I, um, you can read, um, who were predicting we'd go right back to another Great Depression, that that was kind of fundamental, but instead it just went right back to this 2% growth, almost as if nothing had happened, which is pretty remarkable when you think about it. Something else happened really dramatically in this um, picture. Japan had been growing, albeit modestly, but had been growing since the Meiji rest of re Restoration of 1870, if you want to follow uh, that. Um, historically, if you're interested, um, there was for Japan also the big rise um, leading up to World War II, a crash after World War II, when the country lost the war, but starting in 1946 or so, right after the war, with some reforms and so on in China, there was this dramatic catch-up. And this is what people look at as the possibilities. And so the phrase advantages of, of uh, backwardness is sometimes used. That refers to the idea it's a I don't know if I really like the phrase, but it's out there and I'll explain what it means. If you are growing and developing later, you don't have to reinvent technology and indeed institutions, as we'll talk about more in detail, that have been already worked out by other countries such as the United Kingdom originally in terms of industrialization. And so a famous case for Japan, they didn't have to reinvent vacuum tubes. They could just borrow the existing transistor technology and they leverage, so to speak, transistor, transition, uh, transistor um, technology to um, 
um, export products with their relatively lower cost um, labor and build their way um, in a traditional fashion for a country that's um, developing successfully, <clears throat> such as we've seen in Japan and some other East Asian economies recently, China, by having an increasing technology and skill um, content of what they produce, often through a process of technology in their exports. They um, subsequently um, flattened, um, flattened out, continued to grow, although at a slower um, pace. But this was already telling us something about possibilities. And so despite those possibilities, um, the fact remains that even in the period 1970 to 1994, there was actually continued divergence, <clears throat> um, at, least through, at least globally through um, around the middle of the uh, 1990s. And you can draw such a relationship over longer periods of time. So what's going on here? First, we have um, GDP per um, capita. And, and this is in constant 2011 dollars. Right. And it runs um, on the x-axis across in log terms what were these countries' incomes in 1970. So that's the starting point, 1970. And then to see whether or not there's convergence, the data here is on per capita output growth in this period from 1970 to 1994, the subsequent quarter century. <clears throat> Each of these dots represents a country. Um, 152 countries, 152 dots. And the notion is that if the poorer countries are growing faster than the richer countries, they will be on the road to catching up, albeit it may be very slow, it may take a long time. On the other hand, if the rich countries are growing faster than the poor countries, then continued divergence is occurring, such as we saw in that very long-term map of the uh, data, so to speak, from 19, uh, from rather 1750 until 2010. And however, when we put in the best fitting line, this is just a simple ordinary least squares line, but it's the best fit, we see that it, the best fit has an upward slope, maybe not a dramatic upward slope, but an upward slope. And what this is telling us is that overall, the richer countries must be growing faster than the poorer countries, making this line tilt up, reflecting the fact that it's at higher levels of growth, more commonly that we find the higher income countries than the lower income countries. So this is um, divergence, this upward slope of the line in the relationship between initial output per person and the subsequent growth. So that's the key map and key um, graph to look at. And you'll see graphs like this in, um, in all of the uh, main um, economics uh, books on, on growth and so on. However, we have now enough data to be able to confirm, this goes through 2017, that in this current epoch at least, convergence is occurring because we have a downward slope here. And this means that on average, the lower income countries are growing faster than the higher income countries. It may take a long time, but with growth faster among the lower middle income countries and so on, that among the rich countries, over time, there would be catch up. And again, this is absolute convergence. It's not looking at any other factors, which might very well actually um, give a story of the accelerated convergence. You have to look at the rest of the data. But this is um, the new picture, 1994 to uh, 2017, which was the latest um, available when this graph was uh, produced. And the picture is particularly pronounced since the Great Recession, um, so that um, the, the, the gap in some ways it has been 
um, accelerating, that is to say the gap in the higher growth rates of the um, developing countries than the developed countries. A big question mark is what the effects of COVID will ultimately have on this. And among other things, the move away from globalization. Some analysts fear that this will take away opportunities for the lower income countries to continue to grow. And so here we have some picture of what this looked like um, up until um, only uh, fairly recently, but not as recent as we will get in a moment until 2003. And so in this case, instead of looking at the individual um, countries as just dots, as constructed here, the bubbles, so to speak, are in proportion to population. So this blue bubble representing 1950 is the population, reflects the size reflects the population of China, and this large gray bubble next to it is with a slightly higher income, somewhat higher income in 1950 represents India, and here's the, U the USA, and here's Japan. All of these in proportion to their population size at that time. And so here we can see that even though China is thought of as the growth success story, it was not at this period of time. And without going into the details, you can see that, I think, just eyeballing it, that there's an upward slope here showing that there was um, divergence. So that is the, um, is the first phase, right? Then the second phase is here, beginning in 1963 and showing subsequent growth rates until uh, 1976. Once again, you have this very clear um, upward slope through 1976. Then by the time you get at the period starting in 1976 and going to 1989, this is more or less flat. We're seeing the particular case of China, and it's highly um, weighted, as it is beginning its process of growth through 1989, um, having launched its, um, its um, dramatic um, catch-up period, if you want. Some dated to 1978, certainly by 1980. So, depending upon how you um, do the analysis. It's about flat, but it may start to show the beginnings of what you could call per capita convergence. Maybe the countries overall are not converging, but there's lots of, very, there's lots of comparatively small countries compared to the U.S. and Japan even, let alone China and India, um, that are um, low income and continue to be low income, for example, a number of African countries. So this gives you um, an idea of convergence on a per capita basis. There's no doubt that convergence, there seems to be no doubt at all that convergence has occurred at least by this last period, 1989 to 2003. And then this is an update, it's found in the text. And here you can see, looking at the period of um, 2004 up to 2017, there's, a, you could really have to say, uh, compared to all the previous data, a striking, if not even stunning, um, evidence of convergence that is per capita convergence. That is to say, it's the very high growth rates in this period of India and China um, that are dominating the overall picture. You still get, as we just saw, even with one dot for every country, regardless of population size, in the most, in the most um, um, recent period that we looked at, some um, convergence, but even more so on a per person basis. So I think that's also useful to look at and think about when you ask um, the question about whether, whether lower income and middle income people in the world are catching up with the high income people in the world. The answer is a more strong statement of yes in the, in the data here. Here we have what's going on in some selected um, countries and, um, and regions. It's another picture of what we looked at um, before. And we get, as we go this um, further period in the log scale, we get um, some better and clearer sense of catch up. Remember, this is in log terms, um, but it's easier to see 
in this way that indeed, if you look at the case of China, that significant and substantial um, catch up is occurring on this basis with um, notable effect of higher growth rates. Now I want to just say something about absolute versus um, versus um, 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 relative or growth convergence. So um, here the idea is that um, a country such as China and India can grow faster for some period of time than rich countries. But at least at first, until some periods of time occurs, just because um, rich countries are starting at a far higher level of income, a 2% increase in that far higher level of income can represent a larger absolute amount than even a 10% increase in income of a country starting with much lower income. And so here is that kind of picture for you. Um, this is um, the um, case of the 1990 to 2003 period. And here you have the high income OECD countries. And in this period of time, um, we find that per capita output increased by 24%. And that gave you this much, so to speak, of extra output per person. Here we have the case of South Asia and of China in this period. China had this remarkable situation in which growth uh, um, was high enough to essentially triple um, the per capita income, in, uh, rather the per capita output technically, um, in the case of uh, China. But even the 196% um, growth was um, less in a result of extra income than the 24% of growth here. And here we have South Asia, this includes India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal. If we look at even more recent data here, going from 1990 to 2017, this figure is in the textbook, um, we see that there has been um, still very substantial growth in the high-income OECD countries. China in this period, 412% growth um, in output per person. In other words, in this uh, period of time, five times higher output per person in the case of China. And it's, get, you know, it's, get, it's, it's um, getting closer um, to, uh, to, to catching up in absolute terms, but it takes um, some time to get there. Um, eventually you would, as you grow faster, you will eventually catch up. As you get closer to catching up um, in any year, the total amount of um, output per person will actually become greater than the rich country that you're catching up to. Now here is a note of um, caution for you. The very first studies of convergence, um, the, the, first, um, the first one was published in 1986, um, looked at what they had the best data for at that time. That was a little bit before these um, exhaustive projects to try to get uh, good data for many countries, annual, good annual data for as many countries in the world as, as possible. And so William Baumel did this initial study of convergence. The data he had available readily, the countries he was um, also perhaps thinking about, were the OECD countries, the countries that um, were of high income already by um, the early 1980s. And he found that among those high income countries, starting from an earlier period like 1950, found that among these countries, the lower income among them had grown significantly faster than the higher income among them, meaning um, convergence. In this particular way, looking at OECD countries. And here is a reproduction of this with more recent data. It now runs from 1950 to 2007. So a longer period of time, about perhaps twice as many years as Professor Baumel had, and it shows this rather strong convergence that I mentioned. The problem here is that it is um, an, an, a really good uh, application of selection bias. You can find it at the macro level as here, and very often you can find it at the micro level if we're trying to look at the impact 
for example, of, of poverty programs, when programs systematically select from among those who, people who would have done better in escaping from poverty anyway as participants in their program, and drawing two quick conclusions with a small number of people that's part of it, but not carefully selected so that they're the same um, representative in a representative sense, the people with the same characteristics. And so if you're already a rich country, as the high-income OECD countries are, there's, there's, you can put it this way, that you know, there's only two ways to get rich. Okay. One way is to start rich and stay rich, which, which high-income countries have, have done. The other way is to start poor and get rich. And that's, how, that's your sample of rich countries. So just by construction, it had to be that countries that started poorer, such as Portugal, Spain, and Japan, they had to grow faster than richer countries, such as the USA um, and Canada, or there, never, there, there would not have been such um, um, convergence. Indeed, they would not have been um, rich countries at the end of the period. So that's selection bias. You find convergence just because you selected special kinds of countries. In this case, you specially selected the rich OECD countries. And so um, I think that I will stop this episode um, here. And this is always a great um, fodder, if you want, for, for um, analysis and, and discussion. So I'll see you next episode.